This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 4. But what is the value of such a justification in the society we live in, which, in its institutions and its customs, has lost all contact with the sacred? When an atheistic or skeptical or agnostic judge inflicts the death penalty on an unbelieving criminal, he is pronouncing a definitive punishment that cannot be reconsidered. He takes his place on the throne of God without having the same powers and even without believing in God. He kills, in short, because his ancestors believed in eternal life. But the society that he claims to represent is, in reality, pronouncing a simple measure of elimination, doing violence to the human community united against death, and taking a stand as an absolute value because society is laying claim to absolute power. To be sure, it delegates a priest to the condemned man, through tradition. The priest may legitimately hope that fear of punishment will help the guilty man's conversion. Who can accept, however, that such a calculation should justify a penalty most often inflicted and received in a quite different spirit? It is one thing to believe before being afraid, and another to find faith after fear. Conversion through fire or the guillotine will always be suspect and it may seem surprising that the church has not given up conquering infidels through terror. In any case, society that has lost all contact with the sacred can find no advantage in a conversion in which it professes to have no interest. Society decrees a sacred punishment and at the same time divests it both of excuse and of usefulness. Society proceeds sovereignly to eliminate the evil ones from her midst as if she were virtue herself like an honorable man killing his wayward son and remarking, Really, I don't know what to do with him. She assumes the right to select, as if she were nature herself, and to add great sufferings to the elimination, as if she were a redeeming God. In any case, that a man must be absolutely cut off from society, because he is absolutely evil, amounts to saying that society is absolutely good, and no one in their right mind will believe this today. Instead of believing this, people will more readily think the reverse. Our society has become so bad and so criminal only because she has respected nothing but her own preservation or a good reputation in history. Society has indeed lost all contact with the sacred. But society began in the 19th century to find a substitute for religion by proposing herself as an object of adoration. The doctrines of evolution and the notions of selection that accompany them have made of the future of society a final end. The political utopias that were grafted onto those doctrines placed at the end of time a golden age that justified in advance any enterprises whatever. Society became accustomed to legitimizing what might serve for future and, consequently, to making use of the supreme punishment in an absolute way. From then on, society considered as a crime and a sacrilege anything that stood in the way of her plan and her temporal dogmas. In other words, after being a priest, the executioner became a government official. The result is here all around us. The situation is such that this mid-century society, which has lost the right in all logics to decree capital punishment, ought now to suppress it for reasons of realism. In relation to crime, how can our civilization be defined? The reply is easy. For 30 years now, state crimes have been far more numerous than individual crimes. I am not even speaking of wars, general or localized, although bloodshed, too, is an alcohol that eventually intoxicates like the headiest of wines. But the number of individuals killed directly by the state has assumed astronomical proportions and infinitely outnumbers private murders. There are fewer and fewer condemned by common law and more and more condemned for political reasons. The proof is that each of us, however honorable he may be, can foresee the possibility of being someday condemned to death whereas that eventuality would have seemed ridiculous at the beginning of the century. Alphonse Carr's witty remark, let the noble assassins begin, has no meaning now. Those who cause the most blood to flow are the same ones who believe they have right, logic, and history on their side. Hence, our society must now defend herself, not so much against the individual as against the state. It may be that the proportions will be reversed in another 30 years. But, for the moment, our self-defense must be aimed at the state first and foremost. Justice and expediency command the law to protect the individual against a state given over to the follies of sectarianism or of pride. Let the state begin and abolish the death penalty ought to be our rallying cry today. 
Bloodthirsty laws, it has been said, make bloodthirsty customs. But any society eventually reaches a state of ignominy in which, despite every disorder, the customs never manage to be as bloodthirsty as the laws. Half of Europe knows that condition. We French knew it in the past and may again know it. Those executed during the occupation led to those executed at the time of the liberation, whose friends now dream of revenge. Elsewhere, states laden with too many crimes are getting ready to drown their guilt in even greater massacres. One kills for a nation or a class that has been granted divine status. One kills for a future society that has likewise been given divine status. Whoever thinks he has omniscience imagines he has omnipotence. Temporal idols demanding an absolute faith tirelessly decree absolute punishments, and religions devoid of transcendence kill great numbers of condemned men devoid of hope. How can European society of the mid-century survive unless it decides to defend individuals by every means against the state's oppression? Forbidding a man's execution would amount to proclaiming publicly that society and the state are not absolute values, that nothing authorizes them to legislate definitively or to bring about the irreparable. Without the death penalty, Gabriel Perry and Braziac would perhaps be among us. We could then judge them according to our opinion and proudly proclaim our judgment, whereas now they judge us and we keep silent. Without the death penalty, Raj's corpse would not poison Hungary. Germany, with less guilt on her conscience, would be more favorably looked upon by Europe. The Russian Revolution would not be agonizing in shame, and Algerian blood would weigh less heavily on our consciences. Without the death penalty, Europe would not be infected by the corpses accumulated for the last twenty years in its tired soil. On our continent, all values are upset by fear and hatred between individuals and between nations. In the conflict of ideas, the weapons are the cord and the guillotine. A natural and human society exercising her right of oppression has given way to a dominant ideology that requires human sacrifices. The example of the gallows, it has been written, is that a man's life ceases to be sacred when it is thought useful to kill him. Apparently, it is becoming ever more useful. The example is being copied. The contagion is spreading everywhere, and together with it, the disorder of nihilism. Hence, we must call a spectacular halt and proclaim in our principles and institutions that the individual is above the state. And any measure that decreases the pressures of social forces upon the individual to help to relieve the congestion of a Europe suffering from a rush of blood, allowing us to think more clearly and to start on the way to health. Europe's malady consists in believing nothing and claiming to know everything. But Europe is far from knowing everything, and judging from the revolt and hope we feel, she believes in something. She believes that the extreme of man's wretchedness, on some mysterious limit, borders on the extreme of his greatness. For the majority of Europeans, faith is lost, and with it, the justifications faith provided in the domain of punishment. But the majority of Europeans also reject the state idolatry that aim to take the place of faith. Henceforth, in mid-course, both certain and uncertain, having made up our minds never to submit and never to oppress, we should admit at one and the same time our hope and our ignorance. We should refuse absolute law and the irreparable judgment. We know enough to say that this or that major criminal deserves hard labor for life but we don't know enough to decree that he should be shorn of his future, in other words, of the chance we all have of making amends. Because of what I have just said, in the unified Europe of the future, the solemn abolition of the death penalty ought to be the first article of the European code we all hope for. From the humanitarian idols of the 18th century to the blood-stained gallows, the way leads directly, and the executioners of today, as everyone knows, are humanists. Hence, we cannot be too wary of the humanitarian ideology in dealing with the problem such as the death penalty. On the point of concluding, I should like therefore to repeat that neither an illusion as to the natural goodness of the human being, nor a faith in a golden age to come motivates my opposition to the death penalty. On the contrary, its abolition seems to me necessary because of reasoned pessimism, of logic, and of realism. Not that the heart has no share in what I have said. Anyone who has spent weeks with texts, recollections, and men having any contact, whether close or not, with the gallows, could not possibly remain untouched by that experience. 
But let me repeat, I do not believe, nonetheless, that there is no responsibility in this world, and that we must give way to that modern tendency to absolve everything, victim and murderer, in the same confusion. Such purely sentimental confusion is made up of cowardice rather than of generosity, and eventually justifies whatever is worst in this world. If you keep on excusing, you eventually give your blessing to the slave camp, to cowardly force, to organized executioners, to the cynicism of great political monsters. You finally hand over your brothers. This can be seen around us. But it so happens, in the present state of the world, that the man of today wants laws and institutions suitable to a convalescent, which will curb him without breaking him, and lead him without crushing him. Hurled into the unchecked dynamic movement of history, he needs a natural philosophy and a few laws of equilibrium. He needs, in short, a society based on reason, and not the anarchy into which he has been plunged by his own pride and the excessive powers of the state. I am convinced that abolition of the death penalty would help us progress toward that society. After taking such an initiative, France could offer to extend it to the non-abolitionist countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain. But in any case, she should set the example. Capital punishment would then be replaced by hard labor, for life in the case of criminals considered irremediable, and for a fixed period in the case of the others. To any who feel that such a penalty is harsher than capital punishment, we can only express our amazement that they did not suggest, in this case, reserving it for such as Landru and applying capital punishment to minor criminals. We might remind them, too, that hard labor leaves the condemned man the possibility of choosing death, whereas the guillotine offers no alternative. To any who feel, on the other hand, that hard labor is too mild a penalty, we can answer first that they lack imagination, and secondly that the privation of freedom seems to them a slight punishment only insofar as contemporary society has taught us to despise freedom. The fact that Cain is not killed, but bears a mark of reprobation in the eyes of men, is the lesson we must draw from the Old Testament, to say nothing of the Gospels, instead of looking back to the cruel examples of the Mosaic Law. In any case, nothing keeps us from trying out an experiment, limited in duration, ten years for instance, if our Parliament is still incapable of making up for its votes in favor of alcohol by such a great civilizing step as complete abolition of the penalty. And if... Really, public opinion and its representatives cannot give up the law of laziness which simply eliminates what it cannot reform. Let us, at least, while hoping for a new day of truth, not make of it the solemn slaughterhouse that befouls our society. The death penalty as it is now applied, and however rarely it may be, is a revolting butchery, an outrage inflicted on the person and body of man. That truncation, that living and yet uprooted head, those spits of blood date from a barbarous period that aimed to impress the masses with degrading sights. Today, when such vile death is administered on the sly, what is the meaning of this torture? The truth is that in the nuclear age, we kill as we did in the age of the spring balance. And there is not a man of normal sensitivity who, at the mere thought of such crude surgery, does not feel nauseated. If the French state is incapable of overcoming habit and giving Europe one of the remedies it needs, let France begin by reforming the manner of administering capital punishment. The science that serves to kill so many could at least serve to kill decently. An anesthetic that would allow the condemned man to slip from sleep to death, which would be left within his reach for at least a day so that he could use it freely and would be administered to him in another form if he were unwilling or weak of will, would assure his elimination if you insist but would put a little decency into what is, at present, but a sordid and obscene exhibition. I suggest such compromises only in so far as one must occasionally despair of seeing wisdom and true civilization influence those responsible for our future. For certain men, more numerous than we think, it is physically unbearable to know what the death penalty really is and not to be able to prevent its application. In their way, they suffer the penalty themselves, and without any justice. If only the weight of filthy images weighing upon them were reduced, society would lose nothing. But even that, in the long run, will be inadequate. There will be no lasting peace, either in the heart of individuals or in social customs, until death is outlawed. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.